Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And, and what a great gospel for Father's Day, right? You know, you're looking for something about, uh, you know, how there was a father who was taking care of his son or something like this. And instead, you get a gospel about a maniac. So how is this going to apply to Father's Day? But actually, it does. It does very strongly. There's a, a very clear word for we as fathers this morning and also for you as our children, the spiritual children in the flock of Cathedral of the King and our natural children sired from the loins of us men. It's interesting when you look at the gospel reading, the two hallmarks that prove that this man, something was wrong with him. Obviously, the, this man was famous for being, you know, a very dangerous person and someone who's not normal, someone who was crazy, even demon-possessed. The two things that marked him as being crazy was, one, he didn't wear clothes. Two, he didn't stay at home. I wonder if this story were written today, if it would have to be changed somehow. It was something like, and there was a man who wore clothes all the time. And there was a man who was at home all day. He was at home for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. He was home to greet the children when they came home from school. He was there involved in the work of the family all the time. We'd look at that guy and go, whoo, believe Baka, my demonio chef. Guy's got to be crazy. He stays home. Nobody stays home. Nobody wears proper clothing anymore. That would be the guy today whom we think was crazy and full of spirits. This guy here would fit in. He'd be normal. He could run for president for crying out loud. Uh, it's a different society today, it seems like. But this issue of an empty house. He didn't live in a home. His home was empty. His children had no father. And the, the home was just vacant. Perhaps he was a young man and his parents were home waiting for him to return. And he didn't. The home was empty. And this is what I want to address this morning to begin with. The, the empty home syndrome which society faces today. Particularly we as fathers. Because you know, dads, we have a lot of voices competing with us today. We as fathers have a voice into the lives of our children, even into the lives of our communities, if we're community fathers, in the lives of our families, in the lives of the church here. And we have a voice and we have a responsibility to speak, but we have a lot of competition. There's a lot of other voices out there giving our children a lot of different advice, a lot of voices competing with us, and some of them are okay, some of them are harmless, and some of them are downright wrong and misleading, and we could consider them as evil. The internet is a poor parent, but sometimes the internet has become just that. We in our busyness don't have nearly the opportunity to speak into the lives of our families and our children especially than the internet does because they're there hours every day. If they're lucky, they get a few minutes with us. We've got a lot of voices to compete with. And oftentimes those voices that come forth are like the voices that St. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1 verse 18. It says those voices are those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's the voices our children hear. Deacons, that's the voices our community members hear. Priests, that's the voice the church members hear. Voices that suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Many voices come out that just aren't true, but they come out as truth. They'll say, marijuana is perfectly harmless. Won't hurt you at all. Not addictive. It won't, you know, make you any, won't do any kind of damage to you won't hurt your brain or anything else. Uh, young men, performance-enhancing drugs aren't dangerous. They'll just, you know, make you better and stronger and they won't have any effects on you later in life. 
Young ladies, the chemicals that you put into your body or on your body to make yourself bigger or more voluptuous or more attractive or whiter or darker or longer hair or shorter hair or whatever you do that these chemicals profess can do for you, they're not harmful at all. Use them at will, prolifically. Or the voice that says, you're young. you got to get your alcohol on once in a while. That's what being young is all about. You and son Miguel, best buds, right? That's the voices that our children hear. Heard a radio commercial on the bus the other morning on the way to church, on the way to work. And it was full of all of these self-affirming statements. You know, the problems that we have, they're just challenges for us to stand up and great victory. All kinds of really self-affirming statements. And then at the end they said, and when we've got the victory, let's celebrate with a good bottle of whiskey. I was so, you know, inspired by these words, and then it turns out to be an alcohol commercial. Kind of disappointing. But those are the voices that our children hear. That's the competition that we have. Our voice has to also be strong as fathers. There's an interesting verse in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5. You know, Habakkuk 2, 4 is a very famous verse. The just shall live by faith. Love that verse, and Romans quotes it, and the whole Protestant movement was built on that verse. But the next verse is very interesting also, talking about empty homes and how even alcohol abuse can be mixed in with it. Habakkuk 2.5 says, Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. Again, the voice that says, you know, go out and get the alcohol on. Have a good time. Get a little drunk. Nobody won't hurt you. You're young. You can handle it. But Habakkuk says, this betrays you. And you end up with an empty house. You end up staying away from home. Say, well, that's just the Old Testament. What does that have to do with anything? Actually, one of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, we're familiar with the works of the flesh, which are the ones that come before the fruits of the Spirit. But in Galatians 5.21, it's already mentioned a number of works of the flesh. And then it says, envying, drunkenness, and carousing. That sounds kind of like fun, right? Hey, let's have some carousing. Nice, fun, interesting word. But what is carousing? Do we even know what that means? It's kind of a, you don't say it a lot anymore. Nobody calls up their friend and goes, hey, what you want to do today? I don't know. Let's go carousing. Kind of, it's not a common word, especially for us. It also mentions, though, in Romans chapter 13, verse 13. It says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness. Why am I talking about carousing? The Scripture just gives two points there of admonishing us not to be carousers. Carousing, and put in a modern term, you could call it bar hopping. Going around from place to place. Not being at home. When you should be home, when you could be at home doing family things or, you know, doing things that families build each other up with, sharing with each other, having meals together, you're carousing outside the home. And that's what that means. It means bar hopping, either going from bar to bar or club to club, place to place, doing something outside the house and usually involving being drunk. And the voices that our youth hear today and all of society hears today, that's good. That's a good thing. Relax, you know. Loosen up. That's their voice. The voice of the Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine, but it gives you an alternative. Be filled with the Spirit. I can testify. I haven't been drunk very often in my life, twice that I can think of. The last time was 15 years ago. And another time when I was a young teenager, which was slightly more than 15 years ago. Don't laugh. That's me. (laughs) Who said that was a joke? I didn't. I was serious. Anyway, the one thing I can promise you is being filled with the Spirit is a lot more satisfying than being drunk. And no hangover. That's the good part. And you don't have to, you know, let it go on. It can go on day after day, hour after hour. That's what being filled with the Spirit does. That's what Paul says, much better than being drunk. Or if you want an Old Testament verse, 1 Samuel 1.14, when the, the high priest Eli thought that 
Hannah, Samuel's soon-to-be mother, was drunk. She wasn't actually drunk. She was praying. But the high priest thought she was drunk, and he said this. It's still good advice whether she's drunk or not. How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. This is the Word of God. The voice of society says one thing, but we as fathers have to stand up and say, what's the voice of God? What's the Word of the Lord? Be not drunk with wine, but filled with the Spirit. How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. Now, I can already read some of you guys' mind. Okay, Father, I'll put away my wine. I don't like wine anyway. Let's just say alcohol in general, okay? Let's just leave it at that. Whether it's whiskey, whether it's whatever, rum, beer even. He says, don't be drunk with whatever makes you drunk. Be filled with the Spirit instead. That's one of the things we're talking about. The voice of God says, it's not good to be carousing. I gave you your home for a reason. It's a place for edification. It's a place for you to be strengthened and built up and encouraged. Don't forsake your home for the sake of carousing. Because what happens to your health, to your spiritual life, to your life in general? It gets on a downward spiral. It's not the way God made man to live. So that's one of the things he's talking about. There's another issue there. He says he had not put on any clothing for a long time. Again, this is kind of normal today. If you look at some of the sites and some of the, even the magazine ads, just all over the place, you see a lot of people who seem to, uh, you know, be thinking that clothing is very definitely an optional accessory in today's world. There was a song years ago, not that long, some time ago, and uh, it was describing a certain particular type of girl from a certain particular state. And the song went, these girls are so incredible. Daisy Dukes, bikini up top. Heard that song? What's that about? Daisy Duke, what's that? Anybody even know what a Daisy Duke is? I happen to know because I was in the U.S. back when this thing came on. There was a TV show. And one of the characters was named Daisy Duke. She was a girl. And the pants that she wore, she wore my own pants that, let's just say, were extremely abbreviated. Very, very short shorts and very, very tight. There was no mystery about the anatomy of Daisy Duke. You could tell even with the clothes on. And then when they say Daisy Dukes, that's what they're talking about. These very short, very tight shorts. And then what else makes her incredible? Bikini up top. In other words, she's not wearing a blouse. She's not wearing a shirt. She's just wearing basically her underwear. So they say, these type of girls are so incredible. They're amazing because they go out in public in their underwear. And that's what makes them amazing. Well, that's what makes them incredible. That's the line of the song. These girls, so incredible. Daisy Dukes, bikini up top. And you know what? I agree 100%. Girls that dress like that are incredible. Because the actual meaning of incredible means lacking in credibility. We think it means, oh, it's so wonderful, it's so great. But look at the word, in, which means not, credible, not credible. In other words, it doesn't mean, or their statement would say, the less clothes you wear, the more amazing you are. Again, that's not the word of God. And uh, what I've always told people, whether it be a male, female, whatever, what I've learned in, in my life the less clothes they're wearing, the more they're showing on the outside, the more they're hiding on the inside. You hear that. You listen to that. The more they're showing here, the more they're hiding here. Just because they wear Daisy Dukes and basically run around in their underwear does not make them incredible. It makes them somebody you better watch out for. Here's what the Scripture says when it's talking about how young ladies, and this can apply to men also, how we should adorn ourselves in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. It says, don't let your adornment, your clothing, be merely external, not just with the way you wear your hair, your jewelry, the clothes you wear or don't wear, but let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. See, this is God's standard. 
Forget the standards the world is throwing on us, society today, throwing us all these things about how we should act and what we should, how we should disregard what we put into our bodies, the kind of things that we take and the things that we wear or don't wear. He says, what's important? Your heart. That's what the Lord told Samuel way back when he was anointing David. You look on the outward man. That's what our children are taught to look on. But the Lord looks on the heart. He says the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's what the Lord says is valuable. They won't say that. You won't find that on YouTube and, and, and Facebook. Gentle and quiet, boring. Now, gentle and quiet is the characteristic God made us to be. This is what we should be. I'm speaking as a father this morning to not just the young, to, to all of us. This is the characteristics of God. The voice of society would say something else. But we as fathers have to rise up with the voice of God and let them know what the Lord would want. Now, I want to speak to us fathers this morning. There's several things I could mention here. That's not really my goal uh, for the whole thing for this morning. I want to speak to the fathers. Fathers, we can't be like Eli, the high priest. You remember Eli, the high priest, in the time, he was the one that was the high priest before Samuel. And he had sons that were doing wrong. His sons were very wicked. Although they were in the line of the high priest, they were functioning as the high priest, they were doing evil. Did a couple of really bad sins it mentions there in the Bible. Once, they would take the offerings that were meant to go to the people and meant to go to God, and they would steal it for themselves. The fat was supposed to be burned under the Lord. They say, no, we want the fat for us. They didn't know about cholesterol back then. But they were claiming the offerings of God for themselves. And then, on top of that, they were sleeping with the ushers. That's also a sign somebody's not working right. Somebody's not walking in righteousness. And it says Eli knew about it as their father, but he didn't say anything. He knew what they were doing. He knew it was wrong. In this case, very, very wrong. But he said nothing. And you know what happened? Eli ended up under a curse. And his whole family was cursed. And in two or three generations, they weren't the high priests anymore. God replaced them, wiped out the line of Eli. Because Eli saw what was wrong, and he did not share with his children, did not lead his children in the way of righteousness. You see, it's the job of a father to teach. In Scripture, you look at how Moses tells the tells the uh, Israelites, how it says in Psalm 78, many places, teach your children these precepts. It's the job of the father to teach. The shepherds don't really teach that much. Think about it. You see a shepherd sitting down with a sheep going, okay, sheep, A, B, C. Repeat after me. Ba, ba, ba. Good. Shepherds aren't really teachers. Fathers are teachers. Now, we, some in this church, serve the role of fathers and shepherds, different things in the church, but the role of the father, every father among us, the role is to teach. To teach our children the ways of God. Because there are so many voices out there teaching other things. So fathers, we are challenged this morning. If we find our homes empty all too often, if we find the clock, the hands of the clock going way up into the double digits, and yet not sure where our children are, don't know where they are tonight, or maybe they're wondering where we are. Sometimes it's like that. Let our homes be places where our children can find certain things. If we want our children to be home, it's our job as fathers and mothers also to make them places where the children want to be. If our homes aren't attractive places, why should they be there? If it's more attractive to be at a friend's house or at a club or somewhere else, our homes should be places that attract our children, where they want to return to and don't even want to leave. How can we do that? Make our homes places where our children can find acceptance. Make our homes places where our children can find care, where they can find nurturing, where they can find answers, where they can find truth, where they can find love. Most importantly, where they can find you. It's the most important thing our children can find in our homes is us. If we're the ones who are out carousing all the time, it's going to be hard to be a father. It makes it difficult. 
These are things we need to share with our children. These are things we need to open up to them. Now that's the first part of what I want to share. Natural, practical, fatherly advice from a father in the church to other fathers in the church and to children in the church, offspring. But now you know this story is not just on that natural realm. There's also a spiritual message, a spiritual realm in there, which I want to bring out also. It says at the end of the story, after Jesus has healed the man, it says that the people around this town who came in to investigate the report of what had gone on, it said that they came to the place where Jesus and the former demoniac was. They said they found him clothed and in his right mind. Now, what is it, again, pick a spiritual uh, perspective, symbolic perspective, if you were, uh, analytical. What does it mean to be clothed? First of all, we know that clothing is for protection, protection from the cold, protection from certain elements. Protection of clothing is for identity. If we ha have on a certain uniform, people know we're a policeman. We have another uniform, we know we work for a particular company. Clothing can serve as protection and for identity. It says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 27, you have clothed yourself with Christ. So again, looking at this story from a symbolic perspective, when we've clothed ourselves with Christ, we've clothed ourselves with protection, we've clothed ourselves with identity. Whose are you? When you're baptized, you are baptized as Christ and marked as Christ's own forever, filled with the Spirit. But there's something else you do with clothes. You wrap yourself up in them. At least the people in those days did. They didn't know about Daisy Dukes. When they had on their clothes, they were wrapped in their clothes. And if you see, it was in Green Hills yesterday, and a lot of the people there from the Islamic persuasion, when they clothed, they clothed. They got a little bit right here, and that's the only thing that's not covered up. That's like it was in Jesus' day. When Paul said, clothe yourself with Christ, that's what he meant. From head to toe, wrap yourself up in Christ. In other words, be wrapped up in Him. Be consumed in Him. Be, you know, totally immersed in Christ. Because that's the context. He said, "You, when you've been baptized, you've clothed yourself in Christ. When you're baptized, you're immersed in the water. Totally surrounded. Filled with Christ. Now again, I would ask all of us, from young to old, what are we wrapped up in? What do we wrap ourselves in so intensely? Disney? You know, a lot of girls who can name every Disney princess, every movie they were in, every uh, boyfriend they got, all the princes, but they can't name the 12 apostles. What are we wrapped up in? Marvel? DC? Dota? Game of Thrones? Chismis, uh, what do you call it, uh, teleseries, Korean series, that, you know, oh, can't miss that one. What are we wrapped up in? What are we immersed in? Not, 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 those things are not wrong, but I'm saying how much time do we spend with them compared to how much time we spend with the truth, the things that will make a difference in our lives, the things that will empower us to bring healing to other people. These are the important things. And this is what Paul says, clothe yourself, wrap yourself up with Christ. Don't be distracted by the other things. Because those things, they're okay for entertainment, but they're not truth. I'm going to tell you some shocking things, young guys. There's no such thing as metahumans. But there is such a thing as someone being born again of the Spirit. There's no such thing as a Lazarus pit. But there is such a thing as the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That's here. There's no such thing as a particle accelerator. But there is such a thing as baptized in the Holy Spirit, which quickens our mortal bodies and makes us alive in Christ and makes us sensitive to the needs of those around us. See, most, the truth is more interesting than the things that we wrap ourselves up in sometimes. And my challenge as a father to you today is give a little more opportunity a little more time to the truth 
less time to those things that are just entertainment and aren't even real. There's a lot of amazing stories in this Bible. The gospel today is one. I mean, you would think this came out of one of the comic books. Jesus Christ all by himself. 2,000 demons, a man whom chains can't hold, a man whom nobody can stop. And with one word, Jesus puts them in his place, puts the demons out and throws them into the swine, and they're drowned where they belong. And the man is restored and healed. That's a story better than any comic book. Yes or no? You ever see Spider-Man do anything like that? Superman? No. Not even Batman can do that. Jesus Christ and those anointed by His Holy Spirit. Those are the ones who do those kind of things. And that's what you find here. And that's what's in your real life. None of those things you read in the comic books you can ever participate in. This you can. My point is, what are you wrapped up in? Are you clothed with Christ or clothed with so many other things? Not saying you can't ever do those, but watch the balance. Watch your balance. It says there that they came and they saw the man in his right mind. The voices in his head were gone. The voices that were saying, don't go home, stay out here. Throw away your clothes, you don't need them. Act any way you want. Those voices were gone once he met the Lord Jesus Christ. And that same healing can take place in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones and those you know, that we want to help receive healing. Then Jesus told the man, it was kind of interesting, the guy said, Jesus, I want to follow you. In other words, he still didn't want to go home. And Jesus told the man, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home.